the second lecture of uh, Julian Sonner on quantum field theory and chaos. Okay, so um, Sakura, is this loud enough? <laughs> All right, so um, we stopped last time, we stopped uh, at this kind of structure, and I want to <clears throat> go one step further in analyzing this structure. And so in particular, so the idea is um, that we have rewritten the, um, the, the spectral, we have rewritten a, a gadget which allows you to extract spectral information about a given quantum system. And in particular, I emphasize that even though I put some averaging on this generating gadget, the averaging doesn't mean that we fundamentally are dealing with a system that we draw from a, an ensemble of random systems, but that in fact we're mostly interested uh, at chaotic systems, individual chaotic systems, and what we want to extract is the fact that they behave like random matrix systems. And in order to establish that, nevertheless, you have to perform some sort of averaging. So the, the, the averaging that maybe would be conceptually the cleanest would, would be this kind of um, slight energy averaging that I described when we talked about spectral correlations already off an individual system. But other auxiliary averaging procedures could be imagined, like you introduce some artificial parameters that, that you average over, or you average over a small amount of coupling constants, things like that. But what I want to emphasize is that, um, is the next point, is that the physics that follows for such chaotic systems um, is actually universally determined not by the microscopic form that this potential takes, which depends on what particular quantum chaotic system you uh, start off with. Um, and uh, of course, just for completeness, this x, I remind you, was a graded vector of sources where you put the energies in such a way that you that you account energies that correspond to the denominator as fermionic and energies that correspond to the numerator as, as bosonic. But anyway, so um, we're not so much going to insist on particular uh, microscopic properties here. Um, we're going to just say that uh, further now, in a chaotic system, Okay, it is useful to analyze this um, by a symmetry breaking uh, principle. So let's say there is, or this exhibits symmetry breaking. And in fact, eventually also symmetry restoration. And we're thinking about performing an analysis at large D. And la uh, D, I remind you, is the size of the Hilbert space. So there's a, a, a large number of um, energy states that we're interested in. Okay, and so um, this symmetry breaking, so um, quite generally I have argued that we could write this as a sort of N slash N graded system which means that we look at a chain of ratios of determinants that is of length n. But for the spectral two-point function, which is um, sort of the, the, the first non-trivial and also in some sense um, most interesting target to look at, this is two slash two, um, this symmetry breaking pattern, um, at least uh, in the cases that I will return to later, is of the type that you have some graded unitary symmetry, SU2 slash two, which is broken by saddle point to SU1 slash one times SU1 slash one. And then what you do is you actually write uh, a nonlinear sigma model. Um, so you write a um, flavor space nonlinear sigma model um, um, with, you know, the coset in this case SU2 slash 2 over SU1 
slash one times SU one slash one um, as target space. Now th there is a um, classification of the possible target spaces that could be of, of interest, which I will uh, return to. In this classification though, we would call this type A3. And um, so then you will write a theory in which you uh, integrate over the, the saddle point manifold and you parameterize it with a field that I would call Q um, integrated over this target space manifold. So this might be M of Q for this particular symmetry case. And um, it's an action which is basically, well, I'm just going to call it right now sigma model action, um, which depends of Q on, on you, you know, the, 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 the takes the shape appropriate to this coset. And of course, you would retain uh, the insertions. So for example, I'm going to write this in inverted commas because we need to also write these things in sigma model language, but you could have, you know, um, spectral densities in here. Um, I don't know, let's, uh, okay, let's just write two spectral densities, but you could of course have more. Um, now, um, we could at this point go into, as I said, a classification of, um, of, of, uh, what possible cosets are allowed and how this relates to symmetry classes. Um, and I could also write down, of course, um, more specifically what this action is. But as I said, I've decided we, we, we will derive such a sigma model for the case of gravity. And in this case, it will be of this structure and we will go into some more detail. So rather than giving you now, um, um, you know, one more lecture on sort of basics of quantum chaos, I want to leave it at this somewhat formal level but with the promise to return to a specific example and one that is of particular interest for um, gravitational systems this afternoon actually. But I do want to say um, that this structure here, so this flavor space nonlinear sigma model, um, uh, that is sort of a key, sort of a key tool and in particular um, written here um, it, it gives exactly, well, what, why right here? So this, this gives exactly the same spectral correlations as random matrix theory. So it gives exactly the same spectral correlations as RMT. So it's, um, it, it's, it's in some sense, um, in, in one, one way it's a rewriting of RMT, so where you, where you average over random matrices that have the same dimension as the Hilbert space, but in terms of objects that are much smaller. So as I said, in the case of the two point, spectral two point function, this is, we said yesterday is a four by four matrix, and you nevertheless reproduce the physical content of random matrix theory. But what is even more powerful um, in some sense is that this thing can be established for individual Hamiltonians which, which exhibit quantum chaos. So this is a way of deriving uh, random matrix theory for chaotic systems. Now, um, I should still clarify that um, if we could show that this is true for a generic quantum chaotic system so that I can rewrite every individual Hamiltonian of a generic quantum chaotic system in this form. That would be a proof of this BGS conjecture, for example, that, that I uh, said um, uh, was an important out, outstanding conjecture. So to actually give a generic proof of this kind, um, that's very difficult. And there are some approaches. I, I invite you to ask me about them in the question time. But um, the statement is that there isn't such a generic proof. But um, to be concrete for individual quantum chaotic systems that have been of particular interest to us, for example, um, we have been able to establish this exactly um, in those cases. So when I say we, by the way, in this case, I should say that uh, 
That is work with Alexander Altland. Ah, and like Sakura also, I will put um, references um, um, on the website. So with Alexander Altland and also um, work with, um, well, Alex Altland and with, um, with um, uh, Boris Post, Jeremy van der Hayden, and Eric Velinda. Uh, and finally, also I should put, so there's, there's a series of papers which involve us too, but also, um, importantly, uh, Pranjal Nayak, who has contributed to many of these as well, and is also a co-author. Um, and um, so, so, however, the original idea of the supersymmetric sigma model um, is associated with the two names, I would say, principally Wegener and Yefetov. Um, but this sort of symmetry breaking presentation and applying it to strongly correlated many body uh, systems, there is, for example, a paper which I will put on the website by myself and Alex Altland in which we describe this. Um, okay, so, so much for references. Of course, I'm also not really exhaustive about references. Um, Maybe if I produce some type, typed up notes, they will be more exhaustive. Also, of, of course, many important contributions of other people. Um, you want to ask about references? <laughs> OK. <laughs> now, I want to ask, um, um, are you assuming this symmetry breaking pattern? Um, yeah. Because so it depends on the form of the potential, I guess, no? Only a little bit. So my next point um, gives a partial answer to this which is, um, in fact, you can classify the, the possible target space system you can have, and there exists something called the altland zernbauer classification. altland zernbauer classification of RMT symmetry classes. which actually generalizes the uh, Wigner-Dyson threefold way. So Wigner and Dyson, I think basically Dyson taking up the idea of Wigner, they showed there were three of these that they called at that point the Gaussian orthogonal, the Gaussian unitary, and the Gaussian symplectic ensemble. But in fact, you can show that there is 10 of these, um, 10 classes. And interestingly, by the way, this is mathematically exactly the same structure as the periodic table of topological insulators, um, as well as, um, well, it's a classification that comes up a lot and has to do essentially with um, uh, Riemannian um, super coset spaces. So there's also a carton classification of those objects, and those are exactly the 10 same. In physics, this has to do with the presence or absence of anti-unitary symmetries in their combinations. But I don't, as I said, I don't want to spend, we could spend hours and hours talking about this. this is a very beautiful story about essentially quantum chaos, but I want to go um, and talk about more modern um, developments. So um, perhaps what I do want to say is that uh, whether by assumption or not, um, one way of saying what's going on here is that this flavor nonlinear sigma model uh, is uh, maybe epitomizes um, quantum ergodic ph physics. So once you have actually found this symmetry breaking pattern, you have found an action of the symmetry on the degrees of freedom of your system in some sense, and you have been able to establish this and the symmetry breaking, and you can write this, then you've really shown that your system has those level correlations and has this sort of hard quantum chaos and falls into this category. So by the end of today, the afternoon, I want to establish this. We will establish this uh, for, well, let's say ADS2 gravity. And tomorrow, 
I will talk about what can be said in higher dimensions. So in ADS2 gravity, we can actually literally derive this kind of thing. Okay, so, so that's that. The other thing that I want to mention, which um, I just want to, because it fits well into this context of um, basics on quantum chaos, I will only take it up again tomorrow, but that's um, to think about not just the energy spectrum, but to think about operators. And there it is uh, useful to introduce this idea of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So um, just to say, um, so, okay, so far only spectrum. So this, this tells us about chaotic properties of operators. Okay, and this um, is often associated with the names of Deutsch and Shrednicki. Um, and basically, it, it, it is a different approach, although it turns out to be very closely related, as I shall explain, but it is a priori a different approach that attempts to answer the same question, namely, how is it that unitary quantum systems uh, thermalize? And so what they propose is the following. They essentially say um, that if you take a non-extensive operator O, so um, non-extensive meaning that it, that it only involves a small number of degrees of freedom. So if you have like some spin system, you know, you could, you could, for example, call this a local operator if it's a local theory, but basically it refers to only a small subset of the spins. Now, I prefer writing it non-extensive because in this business and also because we've already uh, invoked ADS2, we might talk about systems like SYK, which don't really have locality properties, but you can still talk about non-extensive operators. Think of them as small operators. Then if you look at uh, their expectation value, sandwiched between two energy eigenstates, so there is an energy eigenstate with energy EI and an energy eigenstate with energy EJ, then um, statistically speaking, those um, uh, matrix elements of non-extensive operators in individual energy eigenstates um, should take the form Okay, so for, for, for the time being, should take the form because people talk about the ansatz. So in, in some sense, it is proposed that if that were the case, then a thermalization would follow. Okay, though, so suppose that it takes the form that there is some smooth function that I call O, um, ha, o um, bar of E along the diagonal where E is the average energy. Um, and it has a, a function e to the minus s, which I think of the microcanonical entropy at the average energy, times some f of e omega times rij. So let me explain the remaining symbol. So s, uh, I already said, is the microcanonical entropy. So these are at least uh, on the face of it highly suppressed. F is, so O bar and F are both smooth functions of their arguments that I've already defined E. Omega is, as before, the difference of energies, EI minus EJ. And RIJ is a, in the usual way that people talk about ETH, is a Gaussian random matrix. So here you see random matrix physics comes in as well, but in a slightly different guise. Um, and um, uh, so um, what else did I want to say? Oh, yes, one important thing is that I and J are supposed to be high energy eigenstates in the sense that if you take the thermodynamic limit, the system is at finite energy density. So there's like sort of high energy part of the spectrum, small operators, and these small operators sort of carry the information about thermal physics here. 
but they also have fluctuations, uh, which, which you see um, are these corrections here. Okay, so I, as I said, I just wanted to state it. Um, it's true that if you assume this ansatz, it implies thermalization um, in, of uh, small endpoint functions of the algebra of observables, which falls into this, um, let's say, a given spatial region, and you take all the non-extensive operators in there. So this implies thermalization. But I do want to already make one comment, which is that um, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is um, a different set of developments, which um, is actually uh, in collaboration with uh, David Kolchmeyer, uh, Bauer Muhammad Sanov, uh, sorry, this is getting small, and Daniel Jeffress, in which we actually um, provide a synthesis of this ETH idea and this, let's call it the, uh, the, the random matrix spectral approach. And in particular, what we first point out is that you should think of actually um, this Rij as instead of a Gaussian, a strongly non-Gaussian matrix. So in fact, this Gaussian will no longer be correct. And we're going to use this tomorrow in particular to think about um, chaos uh, as pertains to higher dimensional ADS examples or even some ADS2 examples, but including matter coupled to gravity. Okay, so, but that will be what I will talk, talk about tomorrow. Okay, so um, that's it for the chaos boot camp. And um, uh, I will now go and um, go back and talk about gravity. So um, maybe this is also a good time to pause briefly for questions. Okay. So, so we have basically seen, um, hopefully, what is a viable definition of quantum chaos. I have actually said, I, I did say that in some sense it's, uh, it's, it's notoriously hard to really define quantum chaos well. It's not so hard to do it in the classical case. And then I have um, introduced in some detail, although I also appreciate that still, technically speaking, we've been going a little bit quick, um, two really major, uh, major paradigms to think about this. One is this nonlinear flavor sigma model. Oh, by the way, flavor, because you know we work in this flavor space, which is, uh, the space of these matrices A, which is much smaller than the color space, which in this, in this uh, business, the Hilbert space sometimes gets called the color space. And you can actually think of this very often really in parallel to flavor color and color flavor duality that you find in gauge theories. Um, and the second paradigm is this of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which uh, at first at least talks about operators, not so much about the spectrum, but we will see that the two are deeply related. Um, and, uh, um, uh, well, one of the obvious connections that I've already kind of pointed out will be via this sort of random matrix and its statistics that, that appears here. But those two approaches, so now we are talking about gravity and, and actually we're even going to talk about string theory. Of course, that's what we like, but I do want to say that they are major developments in statistical physics and there are big, interesting, bodies of work by the statistical physics community and ongoing really active work on, on both of these aspects. So it's a, fascinating, it's a fascinating subject in its own right. So now let's go and talk about um, gravity as a chaotic system. So, um, so one thing that's actually going to be uh, very useful in this context is we have discussed all these things in energy space. Um, I have formulated things directly about the spectrum, and so therefore in energy space. 
But it's actually very useful in particular when we compare or when we develop these things in gravity to talk about it also in real time. So I do want to make at least that one um, overview one more time. Um, we were talking, I had this sort of motivational figure of black hole collapse and so on. Let's be a little bit more abstract, but let's just say what are the sort of specific timescales that we should be looking out for that follow or that, that are distinct imprints that leave distinct imprints in these, in these uh, approaches. So, so the earliest time scale is really uh, T beta, which is, which is what people just call local thermalization. And that should be, you should think of that as sort of the classical black hole for, for, uh, forming. Then the next time scale uh, is this scrambling time or Ehrenfest time, which is, um, yeah, this is scrambling. Ah, uh, yeah, very good. Scrambling, uh, scrambling time. And actually, I made a pig zero of that in the sense that, remember, I wrote that things go like 1 over h bar squared times e to the 2 lambda t. Uh, I was thinking of n. So 1 over n is like h bar. It, is, it absolutely has to be h bar squared here, OK? So correction. Um, so the scrambling time basically has to do with one simple way of seeing it is when this small correction, because we're thinking of h bar being small in the semi-classical limit, when this becomes of order one. So um, this scrambling time scale turns out to be Ts uh, usually go uh, parametrically as log of the entropy. Um, and that has to do with breakdown of the semi-classical approximation. And it is also the time scale that at which we discuss this um, butterfly effect. And so this has to do with OTOX. Um, so this, this thing here is, uh, yeah, local thermalization. This is OTOX, OK? And if you want a gravitational um, um, uh, phenomenon that happens at this kind of time scale, um, this has to do with shock wave scattering. Then the next time scale, so now we're getting into the time scales in which we start exploring what well, were that are sort of more uh, uh, indicative of these kind of things here. The, the, the t, t h is called the no, t t is called the Taulis time. Okay, and this is the time scale um, which is related to the range of energies where random matrix theory is a good approximation to the system. So this has to do with RMT. Okay, this has to do with RMT. And you see sort of the imprints of RMT spectral statistics at and after the Taulis time. Now, um, in the kind of systems that I'm interested in, this Taulis time will actually scale polynomially, like s to the 1 half log s with entropy. Uh, but that's not necessarily universally so for all systems. And the final time scale, that is the one which we call th, which is the Heisenberg time. Um, the Heisenberg time is the one that is um, to do with uh, a time scale that scales as the inverse of the average level spacing. So if you, th if you want to have a resolution of your microscope that is good enough to uh, resolve individual energy eigenlevels, you better look at observables that are inversely related in time. So, so basically, at the Heisenberg time scale, you must see imprints of the discreteness of the spectrum of the individual black hole microstates. So this is maybe, for us, is sort of the black hole microstate time. OK, and so what, what we will do is um, I will show you, um, basically, that there is a nonlinear flavor sigma model way of thinking about ADS, particular ADS2 gravity. Um, I will tell you what this tells us about Thales time physics in gravity, and I will also tell you what it tells you about Heisenberg time. And this Heisenberg time physics is actually related to non-perturbative effects in gravity, which in the context of string theory, I will make a side remark, are very closely related to what uh, is being discussed in the lectures by Sen. Okay, so um, by the way, um, why is this always non-perturbative? That's maybe uh, still interesting to know. I mean, you know, if there are e to the s many levels, then one over the level spacing is uh, e to the 
then the level spacing is e to the minus s. So one of the level spacing is e to the s. So this is a time scale that is uh, non-perturbatively large in entropy. And actually, you will find that, OK, we can reinterpret this as the coupling constant dependence, which will be closely related to what uh, Ashok has been telling us about. So let's keep this in mind. Um, there is, uh, as I was uh, alluding to, quite interesting physics also at these, relatively speaking, early time scales. I'm not focusing my lectures on those. But um, if you want, uh, well, not if you want, I can put some references anyway. And they have to do with sort of, as I said, black hole formation and then this classical shockwave scattering. And there's, there are beautiful developments, but we only have finite time, of course. So I want to talk about this because, well, I think in some sense it's more quantum in that sense, perhaps more exciting. OK, so um, very good. In this section, uh, at first you said real time. So uh, this time is Euclidean or Lorentzian? Please speak up. I can't hear what you say. Is time? Time is Euclidean or Lorentzian? You said it's Lorentzian first. time. So you know, essentially, uh, you ask about how do uh, operators or, or observables depend on uh, uh, time evolution, Lorentzian time evolution, and the. Uh, uh, properties of the spectrum because you know if you do time evolution you you know you have phases uh, energy differences and so on those uh, those features they translate into features also in real time so this is actual learns in real time OK, so, um, so um, I have a, a relatively extensive section here on two things, which I will skip except for saying that um, rem reminder, <laughs> black holes of an entropy, which is basically the area of the horizon divided by 4GN. This is, of course, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. And actually, if you, want a, uh, if you want more details on this, there is, of course, the answer question, answer session. But um, this is proportional to the area. And for compact horizons, which is the case that one is usually interested in, um, this is a finite quantity. So we're going to be interested in at least a restriction of the Hilbert space of our system, which has a finite number of states and a finite energy width, and therefore a discrete spectrum. Um, and of course, uh, there is also um, beta, which I actually mentioned before, is actually one over the Hawking temperature. Um, and for, with respect to this beta, we, would, we should think of the, the, the black hole as implying a thermal average, which, which I already mentioned. Okay. Now, there is one thing I do want to mention, because I think it's, it's sort of useful, but uh, we discussed it already. I think you all appreciate it. But the point is that we can actually establish, in this case, even at the level of mathematical theorems in classical GR or semi-classical GR, that there exists a generic uh, set of boundary conditions where you, time evolution leads to black hole formation. Okay, so, so indeed, this, uh, this is a system which results in thermal physics by time evolution. Okay, and that's maybe the strongest argument intuitively why gravity is a chaotic system. But what, um, I, as I said, I want to really establish and hammer down is that it actually has this um, quantum ergodic phase, at least in cases where we have uh, more control over it, which is at the moment in lower dimensions and in this context of ADS-CFT. But uh, of course, tomorrow um, at the end, <clears throat> I, will, I will also um, give some, some thoughts, perhaps speculations on higher dimensions, OK? So uh, right. So um, but what I want to do now is I want to show you how 
the naive way of thinking about black holes, well, naive is, of course, uh, a modern way of saying it. So if, if we use the kind of semi-classical calculations that Hawking did to revolutionize the whole subject, we will find, in particular, tensions with um, what needs to be true, both from a unitarity perspective and from a quantum chaos perspective around these timescales, and it's therefore these timescales where you really start probing interesting features of gravity. So this is something I do want to explain in some detail. And for this, we will need to have this real-time picture in mind. Okay, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about unitarity. Okay, and so the ideas go back all the way to Hawking, but the way that I'm talking about them um, stems from work of Maldacena. So, <clears throat> recall this will, be, this will be a very important thing to keep in mind. So, um, because the dimension of the Hilbert space for the black hole is finite, we're going to get some sharp signatures of unitarity or loss of unitarity um, at late times. And uh, there are several ways of doing this. One would be to talk, for example, about endpoint functions of operators, e.g. two-point functions, actually. Uh, so just OT, O, um, in the black hole background would be a good probe already. Um, by the way, there, if I wanted to talk about this, I would have to invoke some notions from ETH, or it would be, let's say, convenient to do so. Um, but um, there is actually a sort of simpler <clears throat> way, um, which is uh, to talk about things that don't involve, at the moment, operator matrix elements. And this is what people like to call the spectral form factor. Okay? Keeping with our tradition, often I will call it SFF, spectral form factor. Now, this is a probe that has popped up in, in gravity literature a few years ago, but it's actually been... Um, very present in the chaos literature for, for decades. Um, and what it is is basically, um, well, let me write the formula. So F beta of T is a sum, of, is a sum over uh, the Hilbert space twice, Ij, of e to the minus beta Ei plus Ej. Um, minus it times ei minus ej. So this has both a uh, Euclidean time component and a Lorentzian time component. In the Euclidean time component, I have the average energy. And in the Lorentzian time component, I have the difference of energies. And by the way, it is really no coincidence that these kind of properties also appear um, all over the place. Um, but um, so what, what, what does it actually mean? Well, intuitively, you see, the later you wait, the longer you let this thing evolve, the more it becomes sensitive to smaller and smaller differences of the spectrum. Until uh, at the Taulis time, you start probing uh, RMT type physics, and at the Heisenberg time, you start probing actually the physics of microstates. Um, and uh, however, it is convenient to think of this, or you can construct this as the analytic, analytically continued partition function. Namely, you can convince yourself that if you take the partition function z, now really the canonical partition function of uh, beta plus i t times z evaluated at beta minus i t, people like to call this z star, uh, then if you write this as a double sum, you get exactly, well, yes, of course, it's, it's, it's equal to itself. So you get exactly uh, the same double sum that I have here. 
So that's um, a useful way of thinking about it. Um, let me tell you another useful way of thinking about it, but then for actual calculations, uh, at least in the context of gravity, this is a very convenient way to think about it because we know how to calculate partition functions. So, um, So actually, another way of doing this is that if you take um, rho of E1, rho of E2, so our spectral two-point correlation, E to the minus I T E1 minus E2, and you integrate over D E1, D E2, uh, you can convince yourself that that gives you F beta of T for beta is equal to zero. So at the infinite temperature limit, um, this is like uh, uh, a Laplace transform of two spectral densities. Okay, and this is of course not, not a big surprise because I already said uh, sort of morally that this is starting to, to probe um, differences of energy levels uh, and as a function of time, finer and finer differences of energy levels. So that's why, okay, that is sort of probably the reason why um, people called it the spectral form factor. So we can think of this as like a um, spectral probe, a very good spectral probe. Okay. Of course, it has a sort of drawback. I don't know. I mean, we're theorists, so maybe that's not a drawback, but it's not directly an experimentally measurable quantity, unlike two-point functions or endpoint functions, which are. But in fact, it doesn't take too much power of imagination to come up with experiments where if you have control of making um, two versions of the system and entangle them, then you can actually define this in terms of fidelities and decay probabilities. So it's, it's, it's not completely um, exotic. But it's, it's, so it's the time domain version of the spectral correlator, right? That's what I want to say. So now um, let's think about um, some late time constraints on the spectral form factor. And as I said, or as I will probably repeatedly say, similar things can be said about these operators, but they are in some sense polluted by matrix elements of these operators, so we need to input some more knowledge before we can make such statements, so it's a little bit more inconvenient. So um, let's talk about late time unitarity. Okay, so um, what we can do is um, we can talk about something like f of beta and now time averaged. By this I mean I take 1 over t, uh, sorry, I take 1 over t integral 0 to t of f beta of t integrated along some time interval, and I want to consider the limit that this time interval gets very large. Okay, so um, I'm just choosing to look at this because it will give us an interesting constraint. There are, of course, other things you can say about late times that will also be in tension with unitarity, but this is a particularly convenient one. Okay, and so then what you get is um, you basically get uh, the limit that t goes to infinity of uh, the sum i j e to the minus beta e i plus e j times this integral 1 over t 0 to t e to, to the minus i t e i minus e j dt. Okay, and essentially because, you know, of dephasing, this thing projects exactly onto the, the diagonal. This thing is non-zero only if EI is equal to EJ, okay, in this limit that T goes to infinity. And so what I end up is I end up just retaining the diagonal ones, E to the minus two beta EI, where I go from I is equal to one to D. And now um, simple counting uh, just means that this is, you know, of order 
e to the entropy because that's how many uh, number of terms are in that sum. Okay, but in particular, um, we want to say that it is not zero. Okay, this is a sum of positive numbers. It can be small, but uh, it cannot be zero. So that's the fact that this cannot be zero after having taken this time average is really all I want to state because this is already enough to be in tension with uh, semi-classical uh, predictions. But actually what people typically do, so I said that it is small, but it's actually e to the s, so it's huge. But what people usually do is they normalize this. Um, so let, uh, let me write this here. Um, so um, normalized, what people usually do is they actually look at z, z star, so this, uh, this guy here. Um, this guy here, I could have also called it f beta averaged, um, divided by z of beta squared, okay? And this is, of course, still order e to the s. Every partition function is of order e to the s. So this is like order e to the minus s. So this is very small, but non-zero. Okay, and actually, th there is a... There is sort of an uh, intuitive way of, of saying what's happening. What's happening is that this thing decays, um, and it wants to decay to zero. But actually, because we are in a quantum system, um, there are always going to be fluctuations. Okay? And what we're looking at here is the variance of the fluctuations, z times z star. And so even though it fluctuates around zero wildly, the variance is not zero because you have sort of some intrinsic quantum mechanical fluctuations that have to be there. And okay, we could uh, do the chain of arguments that shows you that you've really used the unitarity of quantum mechanics to establish this. But um, so this is basically uh, uh, that, that you cannot kill off, uh, so cannot uh, kill off completely quantum fluctuations if you are effectively in a system with a finite Hilbert space. Yeah. I mean, in, if you take z and z star and also replace i t by minus i t, doesn't it? Sorry? I mean, if you take back this formula, yeah. you have replaced uh, z, uh, you've taken z, z star and also replaced i t by minus i t, right? In the last, in the, just here, last line. Oh, so you think you should have put plus i t here the whole time? No, the, on, on next line, next line. If we, here, here, yeah. Yes. I mean, this looks like it, you get back z of beta plus i t, right? If you do complex conjugation and replace t by minus. No, I mean, sorry. What you do is you. I, I, I said this in words, but um, um, it's not a good notation. So what you do is you take z of beta plus i t, and then you multiply it by z of beta minus i t. Okay. But notationally, for some reason, people want to call this z z star this quantity. I see. So this is what you, so when I, when I write ZZ star without the arguments, it's what I mean okay. here, okay? okay? So okay. Uh, thanks for clarifying. Okay. It's bad notation, but I don't think I'm going to take the blame for this because you see this often. In, I see. Yeah. Okay. But Thank you're right, of course. Um, right, so... Um, good. Uh, I think I, I can draw this diagram, which basically uh, diagrammatically says this, uh, visualizes what I said in words, but it will be useful. And it's a diagram that I think many of you will have already seen, but um, since we want to reproduce it this afternoon in gravity, why not draw it once? So this is this thing where, you know, you look at, uh, maybe logarithmic function of time and the log of the spectral form factor. And what you find is that initially it decays and it may look like it decays all the way to zero, uh, it just keeps decaying. But in fact, as we pointed out, that would not be compatible with a unitary quantum system. And in fact, what happens is that this decay at some point uh, gives way to a rise that uh, may seemingly go on forever, 
But in fact, again, um, the estimation here uh, is correct. So that the fact is that it's, it does terminate at order e to the minus s, um, basically the contribution of an individual quantum level. So what you find is that it does terminate at some point at uh, where the fluctuation will be. Okay, so uh, fluctuation will be of order e to the minus s. Okay, so there is some initial decay. Okay, this is cured by some, some uh, actually turns out to be exactly linear rise. Um, we, in, in our field, we like to call this sometimes the ramp. And this finally uh, results in, in this plateau behavior, which again, in our field, we call the plateau. Okay, and um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a semi-classical gravity calculation and we're going to see what actually you find for this curve, um, find for this curve here. And okay, um, question. can I just say that first and then maybe that will already be the question because um, what actually uh, happens of course is that there is going to be, the actual signal is going to be uh, very, uh, erratic here, so it oscillates a lot. I don't even want to draw all the continuous oscillations. What I'm showing is the average behavior, okay? And these fluctuations here is the sort of, so this is the thing that comes from, as I said, the quantum noise. So now, um, there was a question. Yes, uh, it's a very naive question. So the, the, the plateau is very, um, the, the height of the plateau is very small, e to the minus s. Yeah. So in comparison, how, what is the order of the minimum? Ah, uh -huh. um, good. Um, so I don't know how to say this sort of universally. I don't think this is a universal uh, uh, quantity, but you can always, in systems where you have more control, you can estimate it because you will ask what is the decay? So it might be something like one over T cubed, okay? And then this thing might be proportional to T. And then you ask, you know, what is the value here? And um, roughly speaking, where is the intercept? So where do these two meet? But it is actually um, a, a measure, the, the size of this hole here, is a measure of the amount of spectral correlations that you have in your system. So people also sometimes call it the correlation hole. And in, in different quantum systems, it can be more or less deep. But of course, as I said, we have, calc well, we and others have calculated this, for example, for SYK uh, and other systems that are of interest in, in gravity. But um, actually, uh, very good, sorry. This uh, also motivates me to write that this guy here is the, is the Heisenberg time, by definition. And this guy here, approximately, okay, because here tastes differ, but approximately where this dip is and where the linear rise starts, this is what people like to call the Talus time. So uh, answering the kind of question that you asked is also in the same class of questions that to say what actually is the Talus time. And as I already mentioned before, this is for strongly correlated many body systems is not yet understood to be universal in any way. For weakly coupled single body quantum chaos, there is a universal formula which was given by Taulis. But um, yeah, so that's why I can't give you a sort of good answer exactly what is this. And I guess a similar question is about the um, proportionality uh, in, the, in the ramp, what is the proportionality constant? Ah, is no, good, no, but that is, that is fully universal. That is determined by which of the uh, uh, symmetry classes you're in. And so if you choose the right units, which is actually units of one over Heisenberg time, the coefficient in the unitary symmetry class is one. In the orthogonal, it's two. Uh, okay, that there's, okay, there's a lot of things that we can say. I now uh, hesitated a little bit about the orthog orthog orthogonal class because the fact that we like to draw this kink here is actually, uh, um, also not true for all symmetry classes. So the orthogonal one will start sort of linear and then it sort of curves and really only asymptotically reaches a plateau. So this sort of stark distinction between what is ramp and what is plateau is not present 
in all symmetry classes. And in the orthogonal one, it starts with, I didn't draw it like this now, but it starts with twice the slope and then has corrections. In the unitary class, it has slope equal to one with no corrections. And okay, so this is the last comment that I will permit myself. The fact that there are no corrections is actually very nice because it's related to a supersymmetric non-renormalization theorem for this supersymmetric nonlinear flavor sigma model. And that only is uh, at work in the unitary symmetry class. Whereas the others have corrections because such a sort of localization doesn't happen. Okay. Um, so I have 15 more minutes, right? So good. So what I want to say um, now is I want to give you, um, yeah, very good. I want to give you a treatment. Um, okay, so first of all, there, there is a, Very similar story uh, for correlation functions. So these also have sort of this uh, initial decay. Oh, not T3, by the way. Sorry, I can't even write my exponents. T cubed. Um, uh, they have some initial decay, um, which may be initially something like a Gaussian, then gives rise to a power law then that's cured by some rise and some plateau in the end. But as I said, we would need to also talk about the operator matrix elements. Um, um, and in fact, uh, this was clarified a lot in a paper where Prangel played a leading role. Okay, so, um, right, so what does gravity predict for now? So what we're going to do is we're going to do the semi-classical calculation of the partition function. We're going to analytically continue it in this sense. And we're going to see what happens at late times. So, um, so indeed, so we calculate z of beta. Then we analytically continue well, two versions of it, okay, to get ZZ star. And then we see what happens. So, um, actually, later, later today, well, okay, now let's just, let's just do it. So, um, one convenient uh, um, arena where this can be done, so it can be done quite generally, not, not clear how explicitly in all dimensions, but one example is ADS3, and I will also comment on ADS2. ADS2 is the one that will give us this one over T cube decay. And so if the idea to calculate Z of beta is basically to calculate the, well, one loop partition function of ADS3 gravity um, around the thermal saddle. Okay, because what we already said was that um, the thermal state uh, of the, the field theory uh, is mapped to a particular geometry, which in this case is a black hole. And the three-dimensional black hole is sort of particularly nice, is this BTZ black hole, and things can be done particularly explicitly. Um, I don't have all the references. I think the main reference that I followed was by um, Xi Yin and collaborators, but I think Ashok, I think you also calculated some of these determinants. Um, but uh, just to give you a sketch, therefore, so in ADS3, what you get is Z of beta, it's basically going to be um, E to the minus the Euclidean action of the BTZ black hole um, times some one loop determinant uh, delta of beta. So this is the 
uh, this is the on-shell action, on-shell Euclidean action of the BTZ black hole. And this is the one loop determinant of gravitons around it, or you know what you call gravitons in three dimensions, boundary gravitons. They are in inverted commas gravitons. Um, so uh, it's, it's technically not an easy calculation, although it follows standard techniques in the sense that um, you know, gravity is a, is a theory that has a local, uh, is a diffeomorphism symmetry, so you need to fade of pop of it, and you need to decompose into the fluctuation modes. Um, and of course, because it's also a tensor theory, there is you know, the, the structure of the quadratic fluctuation operator around the saddle is a, is a little bit complicated, but it's, uh, it's nevertheless a standard analysis in actually this sort of, uh, yeah, Euclidean approach to gravity. Uh, people sometimes even call this thing Euclidean quantum gravity, which uh, came from the Cambridge School, like Hawking, Gibbons, uh, Perry, and so on. Okay. And so um, what we find is, okay, one finds, um, And by one, uh, um, okay, now I don't remember. Maybe I'll give the references later. But as I said, um, a paper that I looked at was by uh, Sheehan and collaborators. So one finds that Z of beta um, takes the form um, um, well, first of all, it's, it's the pattern goal over these metrics, dg e to the minus k s of g, where k is LADS in three dimensions over 16 uh, g Newton, okay? And you uh, integrate over metrics that asymptote to a torus um, with thermal circle uh, cir circle beta. Okay, so and once the dust settles, um, actually what you find is that Z BTZ, um, I, okay, sorry, and of course what you do is you evaluate it on the saddle point, which is the BTZ black hole, you expand it in quadratic fluctuations around the saddle point, the saddle point action comes out with this coefficient, that's what gives you this part, and then the integral over the Gaussian fluctuations around the saddle is what gives you this determinant. The determinant is very important because that's actually the thing that gives you the decay, interestingly. So if you look at Z of beta T, uh, let me write it in the form that we should, beta minus I T, what you find is the expression, um, well, it goes like one over T to the six, times e to the 16 pi squared beta, or is it beta? Uh, beta, excuse me, over beta squared plus t squared, okay, times this constant k. And as you can see, this decays as t goes to infinity, this decays to zero, like exactly to zero, uh, and not, uh, order e to the minus s. So what this shows is that, okay, if the actual function decays to zero, then the long time average, you, it's easy to convince yourself that the long time average also will be exactly zero if you take, take, uh, take time t to zero. So the gravitational answer has actually produced something here for ADS3 now, which, okay, let me write it not log log, but just in real time. So t and this z, z star for btz, which just decays to zero. Um, one over t to the six. So um, semi-classical gravity let's say 
misses the ergodic phase. Okay, this is now in our language of, of quantum chaos, but the way that it is usually phrased, because it's also just in, in flagrant violation of this very simple unitarity constraint, so even if we didn't know about quantum chaos and so on, and we associated this to time scales that have some meaning to us, uh, we, would, we would say that this can't be right for a quantum system that has a finite Hilbert space and that lives on a finite manifold. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as you know, in uh, Euclidean quantum gravity, so you fix the boundary torus, and you have um, you infinite number of manifolds that you have subtle. to sum over, like a thermal ADS, but, yeah. uh, besides uh, BTZ and so on. So if you take into account this sum, this is not going to change the result? or, or As far as I know, um, but I'm, so I, I've thought about this at some point. Other people have. Um, if I remember correctly, it does not, it does not just solve this problem. So you, actually, the, the kind of configurations that do solve this problem are other saddles, the, not saddles that you would have included in this analysis. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we'll actually ex we will explicitly um, show what these configurations are in, this afternoon in ADS2, and maybe tomorrow um, make some comments on ADS3. Um, the, um, okay, yeah, let, let me write a couple more things. So, so as we shall see shortly, and we will be a bit more explicit about the calculation, um, if you actually take the Z, um, of the um, JT, so this, this is ADS2 basically. Okay, in ADS2 we will work with this so-called JT gravity. So if we take Z, Z, Z star JT, we will find that it has this decay one over T cubed. But we will talk more about this, and, and as I said, be, if time permits, more explicit about the computation. Um, but um, maybe uh, the last thing I will say is that, okay, so the, there, is one, uh, there is one generic point that can be made which is quite useful, which is maybe the most important one to, to uh, um, extract from this. So I've, I've basically argued by, by example, I've shown you two examples, which maybe if we add one more for physicists that becomes a proof, but uh, it's not. But what I want to say is there is actually a, a general lesson here, which is that this decay um, comes from the fact or corresponds from the fact, comes from the fact that uh, supergravity or, or semi-classical gravity in this approximation produces uh, a continuous spectrum. So it's sort of maybe we can say a continuous approximation of, of a row of E, okay, which uh, in the actual theory we know to be a sum of delta functions because we are, um, as we have said so many times, in the case of a finite Hilbert space and a finite quantum system. So, so in some sense there is this sort of, uh, let's say, the word information loss here because the system has lost the imprint of the discreteness of its, of its level spectrum. So this is why sometimes people uh, also say that this is a manifestation of information loss. And the second, uh, second remark in the same vein is that um, the, the, the goal, therefore, is to produce a calculation that sees uh, the individual microstates. Okay, and so this is actually something which, um, of course, is a sort of a long-standing 
problem in, in quantum gravity. It's in, 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 in some ways even maybe the program of quantum gravity. And um, um, there are many ways to think about it. Uh, and what, uh, as I said many times, what I'm going to describe or what I'm describing in these lectures is that I'm hitting this kind of problem in this specific setup with uh, the machinery uh, uh, of, of quantum chaos actually produces some very interesting results about precisely the non-perturbative effects in quantum gravity which are sensitive to individual microstates. And in the context of two-dimensional JT, two-dimensional gravity in general, um, this really is, if I'm not entirely mistaken, the same kind of physics that uh, is being described in Ashok Sen's lecture, but as you appreciate, from a very different kind of uh, physical perspective. In higher dimensions, of course, I think there is less control over these non-perturbative effects um, because we, we might not have sort of the nice string world sheet uh, technology. But um, as I said, I will tell you how uh, this quantum chaos machinery can actually make some progress also in those cases. So I think um, I'm even leaving four minutes for questions. Officially. Thank you. Yes, so let's thank Julian. <laughs> okay, so now before lunch we have some time for questions, uh, both for Julian and uh, for Sakura, if you have. Hi. Um, can you maybe explain a bit more how do you compute the one loop determinant? Um, um, no, because like, let me just say it like this, I will, I will explain it in the ADS2 case as part of the next lecture. Um, um, I think that's maybe more useful than trying to go the, through the ADS3 case. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, I would like to ask, uh, are there possible phenomenological ob observables uh, which may be um, somehow signature of, the, of individual microstates? Uh, in order to be clear, I'm thinking about something like tidal love number, quasi-normal modes, something similar. Yeah, that's, um, that's a very good question, which every now and then um, I ask myself. But um, so I, I haven't, I haven't sort of thought about this too hard. Maybe it's not sort of the, the mindset that I have, but what I can say is that there have been speculations, indeed, of people that want to look for uh, sort of this kind of physics here, maybe these fluctuations, by looking, at, uh, by looking at imprints. So they were sort of arguing about gravitational wave echoes and that they might be visible in those things. I, I'm really far from being an expert on this. I'm not uh, uh, maybe qualified to judge on the plausibility of this. But what um, one thing I suppose is that, I, so one thing I did not mention here, uh, which is more closely related to what you're asking, is that uh, in quantum chaos, so there was this, um, well, in chaos theory, there, there were these uh, Lyapunov divergences. There is also another thing which is named after, I think, last year's uh, ICTP Dirac medalist, that is Ruel resonances. And those just correspond to quasi-normal modes. But um, from our gravitational perspective, I mean, gravi gravitational quasi-normal modes is something that we understand very well, so it's not maybe, uh, you know, the hardest iron to push right now. But there is certainly some, some chaos imprint uh, that, that comes in the quasi-normal modes, and that's, of course, will be in the ring-down effect of, of, of gravitational waves and so on. But uh, maybe even if I am personally not doing it actively now, this is, this is a very important question. It would be very interesting to know if there are such imprints. But one might say, perhaps, it's quite ambitious. Because, you know, what experiment do you want to do which is sensitive to these small energy differences and also which has uh, sort of a reach to the kind of time scales that we're talking about? But then let me not discourage you. Uh, I think it's a very important question to ask in general. Yeah.
we have more questions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> maybe I can ask a sort of vague question about the goal you've written at the end. Um, is the idea to produce a calculation that uh, in a statistical sense, sees the individual microstates, but perhaps doesn't recover exactly this set of delta functions? Um, well, so the story that I'm going to tell this afternoon will achieve that. When we set out, our goal was to actually find the individual microstates. Uh, so the overall goal would still be to, to try and find actually the individual microstates rather than a statistical imprint of individual microstates. Um, so that's actually also a class of questions which is very important, which I hope to be able to comment upon uh, as, as we go on. But um, the technology that we have that gets the plateau um, and that gets the flavor nonlinear sigma model, it gets the flavor nonlinear sigma model sort of after this averaging bar. Whereas my personal hope was that actually this technology would allow us to go even one step further back, and yeah, but that's, uh, that's one of the key questions, I would say. More questions? So uh, this, in the spectral uh, form factor, this uh, ramp and pl plateau behavior, is this universal for all the 10 RMT classes? Uh, yes and no, I mean, in the sense that I already said it. So, the general feature that there is some rise and that it caps off, that's universal, but the actual way that it does it is not. Uh, that depends from one uh, ensemble to the next. And in particular, except for the unitary case, there isn't this sort of linear ramp and then suddenly a plateau. There is more like a continuous curve, which has an interesting and non-trivial uh, diagrammatic expansion. Perhaps you also have some questions for uh, Sakura, since we didn't have much, uh, much time for extra questions after her lecture. I guess we are all very hungry. <laughs> all right, so if not, uh, we can go to lunch uh, and we will resume at